Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. This is the fifth in our uh, freshwater forum at Cranbrook Institute of Science and the Nature Conservancy's sixth lecture series, What's So Great About the Great Lakes. We're very excited about this evening's lecture. Invasive species is very much on the radar of anyone who lives in the Great Lakes area and really the national focus. And I was told to make certain that it's known that we have the gentleman who sort of sounded the first alarm leading the team that first detected the DNA in the water system leading into Lake Michigan. So the expert is here with us and we're excited about that. A couple of things that before we start, um, I will, we've been doing well without a mic afterwards, for those of you who know when we do the question and answer, but I will have one. So if you'd prefer to have a mic for your question, just signal me, I'll probably be over there with it. But so far it's worked well. If at any point you can't hear or you're having trouble understanding, just raise your hand and we'll try to adjust as best we can. Secondly, the week of April 5th, some of you will remember last month being here during winter break when we were cleaning a cannon in the lower lobby. It's not there tonight. Thank you for your patience in working around that last month. Um, we'll be doing the second round cleaning during spring break, April 1 through 5, 1 to 4 every day, um, as well as uh, Got Science, which is a different themed science field activity every day. So you can pick and choose which field of science interests you most come that day. The complete schedule is online. So it will be different activities and it's a great way to sort of sample different scientific fields. The spring cleaning was very, uh, spring, the winter break cleaning was very successful. We learned a couple interesting things about the cannon. We uh, were able to clean off enough that we found the monogram. It, it was George the second, not George the third as we initially thought which means it's pre-1760. And we also found some inspection indicators when it went through the inspection process. They actually incise into the cannon. And it looks like from what we know, it was probably rejected for use by the Royal Navy. But it, will, um, it was probably sold to a merchant or leased to a merchant ship for protection. So that's what's going on at the Institute. But back to tonight, I'd like to thank Northern Trust before we begin for their support and also Michigan Radio for um, their media sponsorship of the event. Our speaker tonight is Lindsay Chatterton, an Aquatic Invasive Species Director for the Nature Conservancy's Great Lake Project. As I mentioned, Lindsay is part of the four-person team that developed the environmental DNA surveillance method used to track the invasion of Asian carp in the Chicago waterway system that artificially connects the Great Lakes to the Mississippi Basin. His current research interests include developing new methods of controlling invasive benthic predators, and improving biosecurity surveillance efforts across the Great Lakes region. Lindsay previously worked for the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. I understand you are a New Zealand native and you have a marvelous accent and was told, if you're having trouble understanding, raise a hand and he will adjust and slow down accordingly. We appreciate that. Um, he worked on a diverse array of coastal marine and freshwater research and conservation projects in New Zealand and he has experience in the management of invasive species in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, including island rat eradication programs, and incursion response efforts to contain or eradicate introduced marine algae, invasive freshwater fish, and Didymosphenia geminate, a freshwater diatom commonly known as rock snot. I think we'll want a couple notes on that, please. <laughs> Lindsay earned a BS in, um, and MS in zoology from Canterbury University in Christchurch, New Zealand, majoring in limnology. I think that's it. Welcome. Look, thanks very much, Steve, and, and thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. I um, appreciate there's apparently a basketball match on tonight, so the fact that you've come out tonight uh, is much appreciated. Um, just to let you know, this here is Didymosphenia geminata, or rock snot. It's a, uh, it's a freshwater algae type species that basically encrusts, um, uh, encrusts the, the rocks of, of sort of trout streams and, and basically completely covers them. It's, a, uh, it's an invader that actually came to New Zealand from North America on the, on the boots of, uh, felt sole boots of, of trout fishermen. Uh, this here is the New Zealand mud snail that we gave you in return. Uh, all, all, <laughs> all evidence is that it may well have ended up coming to the US, uh, at least on the, on the west coast. Uh, again, probably associated with waders or, or contaminated fishing equipment. So look, again, thank you very much for, for coming here tonight. Um, just to reiterate, I, I work for the Nature Conservancy, um, and, and the Conservancy's mission is, is really to um, 
you know, to conserve the land and, and waters uh, of the world in which we all depend. And, and really, our vision is to try and leave, uh, I guess, leave, leave the world, leave, leave the planet in a much more sustainable way and, 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 a, and a better place for future generations. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about a, a broad range of research uh, and, and projects that we're involved in, some of which we're not involved in. Much of the work uh, that I will talk about has arisen out of collaborations with uh, Dr David Lodge and Dr Chris Jurdy uh, at, at the University of Notre Dame, as well as uh, Andy Mahan and, and Tracy Gallarowitz at Central Michigan University. The simple reality is, is that most of the work that we do we couldn't achieve without the partnership and collaboration of many of the state agencies, and in particular the likes of Indiana DNR, Michigan DNR, Illinois, Department of Natural Resources. These uh, agencies have been key to allowing us to get the work done uh, in the field and, and in many ways generating the ideas and the research questions that we're looking at. Um, but in addition to that, the likes of the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, again, have been important partners as well as funding agencies for this work, uh, as has the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the Great Lakes Protection Fund. And so while I've tried tonight to, um, to note who the key partners are on some of the work I'm talking about, really what I want to get through is that there is a big team working on the, the, this issue within the basin, and we're just part of that team. Um, I was reflecting on, on a comment my, my boss made before I came, and, and, and he pointed out that as a Kiwi, I, I bring a sort of a unique perspective to the problem. And, and I wasn't entirely sure quite what he meant. I think it was a compliment. But when I, when I thought about it in a bit more detail, I thought about the sort of work I used to do as, as part of the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. Now, for those of you that don't know, the New Zealand fauna and flora evolved in the absence of native mammals. There's two native species of bat surviving today. And so what that means is that we have these large gigantic in insects. This is a, a predatory snail. This is something called a weta, which is like a big cricket. This is about six inches long. These wetas essentially fill the same niche as mice and rats. You know, this is a large invertebrate predator. This is Peripetus, which is a um, velvet worm. It's, it's the link between worms and, and insects. Um, this is something called the Tuatara, which is sort of the closest living dinosaur. It's a Svenodon. It's got these large holes in its skull. So it's a very ancient form. And then we have something like the Kakapo, which is the flightless parrot. And these, these two species here are extinct. This is the Moa and Harst Eagle. This thing had a wingspan of three metres. The point being is that this fauna and flora evolved in the absence of mammals, so you've got all these species filling these gaps. But what's happened in New Zealand is that with the colonisation of New Zealand by Māori and then by Europeans, we've introduced a, a suite of mammalian predators and competitors. And so the extinction rate in New Zealand is second only to Hawaii. So we've had things like you know, three species of rat, three species of mustelid, uh, this is the Australian bush possum. All of these things are preying upon or competing with the native fauna, and, and so we've seen large extinction rates and, and we've got a, a suite of species that are now on the cusp of going extinct. And then in a freshwater system, we've also, also introduced a suite of salmonid species, brown trout, rainbow trout. New Zealand's renowned for its trout fishery. But of course, those species have impacted the native fish fauna. And so when I thought about the Great Lakes, really there are some nice analogies here. If we think about the, the sort of Great Lakes food web in, in a really simplistic form, we've got plankton species, so these are sort of the algae at the bottom of the food web. Uh, we have a set of sort of water fleas and hoppers that are sort of the next level in the food web. And then we've got a diversity of mussel species, so this is a sort of a, a group that's proliferated um, to take advantage of the sort of filter feeders in the system. And then we had these midwater fish, the, the lake whitefish, the lake herring, the ciscos, the corrigonids, that we're starting to diversify, uh, and, and really this is where a lot of the unique sort of features were starting to evolve in the Great Lakes. And then we had the single top predator in terms of the, the lake trout. But unfortunately, this is what the food web looks like today. Over 180 introduced species have established within the Great Lakes, of which about 20 or so of those have become what we would call invasive. So that means they're having a net impact on either the ecology or the economy or on human health. So in, when we talk about invasive species, we're not talking about all introduced species, we're just talking about those that are actually having a net impact. 
So now we have a food web that's dominated by zebra and quagga mussels. So these are two species from the Pontocaspium that really dominate the bottom of the food web. These are filter feeders. They're sucking really the, the base of the food chain out of the system. And then we've got things like the bloody red shrimp and, and, and the spiny water flea, again sort of planktonic predators that are both preying on, on the natives as well as uh, feeding on, on that other base of the food web. And then we have things like the round goby, rainbow smelt, alewife that again are now dominating that mid-level of the food web. We've introduced a bunch of large salmonid species, king salmon, coho salmon, pink salmon, uh, that now are sort of what appear to be the dominant predator within the system. But actually the top predator is something called the sea lamprey. And it's feeding on both the lake trout, the midwater, um, you know, the midwater natives, but also preying upon things like the, like the large uh, salmonids. And so you've got a food web that is now dominated by these introduced species. Uh, vastly different from what we see now, in many ways very similar to what's happened in New Zealand. And just to give you some idea of the sorts of impacts that this top predator, the sea lamprey, is having. So it's a parasite. This latches onto fish and essentially sucks the goodness out of them. So this is the sort of damage they're doing to lake trout. Um, you know, basically it's latching on and it's just sucking the goodness out of them. And uh, this data that suggests that the decline in lake trout that occurred in the, in the 40s and 50s in many ways was you know, driven in part, at least by um, parasitization, parasitism uh, by sea lamprey. So one of the other sort of key, well, one of the big key drivers in the system are these zebra and quagga mussels. And while we've seen, we've seen impacts upon people's shopping ability within the basin, um, <laughs> the real impacts have, have, actually, have actually occurred at a more broad scale uh, ecosystem level. So as I said, native to the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, probably introduced to the Great Lakes via the Baltic Sea, via ballast water. So this is the water that ships take on board to balance their cargoes. And of course, when they come across here as they take or put cargo on board, that water is discharged. When they take the water on, they're taking on all the life that's in that water. And some of it's capable of surviving a, a five or 10 day journey across the ocean. And so it's discharged into the lake. So this is an example of ballast water exchange. Um, you know, the, the water's being discharged and with it all of the organisms along it. And these, this, this thing is established within the basin. This is a satellite picture of Lake Erie taken in, in November 2000, uh, sorry, October 2011. And it's showing massive algal blooms within Lake Erie. So that's the light green smudges you see on this picture. These are really large algal blooms and, and essentially they're being driven by two things. Excess nutrients within Lake Erie but also the feeding of zebra and quagga mussels. So what, what the zebra and quagga mussels are doing is they're stripping out the competitors to the, these algal, um, to these algal, harmful algal bloom species, but they're also stripping out some of the zooplankton, so you're encouraging the growth. And the other thing they do is, with their pseudo feces um, that the mussels are producing, it's a way to remobilize the nutrients, and we get this sort of spring flush of nutrients, which is driven by the pseudo feces so, of, of, the, of the zebra and quagga mussels that really dominate the, the sea flora within Lake Erie. The impacts of that, we see depleted zooplankton, we see altered water quality, uh, as I said, harmful algal blooms, but ultimately we, we're generating unstable ecosystem with impacts upon both fisheries and then also other commercial impacts. While we folk, well, I guess our primary interest is, is the ecological impacts. Yeah. The economic impacts of this species or these two species has been dramatic. This is what an algal bloom looks like up close. Now, if you wanted to swim in this, you, you've probably got to cross a beach covered in, in the shells of this animal. Uh, and so you've just, in terms of a recreation, you've, you've got two impacts here that are impacting the ability for us to enjoy the Great Lakes. But the true cost comes from this. This is a cross-section of a pipe that is chocker full, it's choked up with zebra or quagga mussel shells. So they're getting into these pipes, settling out, and they don't, they don't care where they are as long as there's water flowing. And so you are seeing costs, hundreds of millions of dollars of costs within the basin associated with cleaning the water intake and the, and the piping infrastructure associated with many industries. And so we, we see big impacts upon you know, the electrical generation industry, nuclear power plants, coal-fired power plants, uh, any water user, so municipal water supplies. In addition, shipping, uh, sorry, it always does that. Um, you know, as I said, the beaches, but also impacts upon the likes of recreational fishing, commercial fishing. And then we also see fishing on, uh, impacts upon um, you know, wildlife tourism. So we see outbreaks of avian botulism, which is driven by the fact that zebra and quagga mussels produce an environment which encourages um, you know, the botulism bacteria to, to proliferate. Um, these mussels are fed on by round goby, another introduced predator. Um, it picks up the avian botulism, and then of course the likes of the loon or the cormorant feed on 
on these round gobies get the disease and, and we see these die-offs across the basin essentially driven by this species here. If we look at the sorts of money, we're not, this, this is, we're talking some serious money here. So the average power plant or large power plant is spending over a million dollars a year just to keep its water intakes and its pipes clean of these two species. And so with 106 power plants across the basin, we're talking real money. In addition to that, municipal water supplies and any industrial user, anyone that's using water in any part of their process and taking that water out of, out of the Great Lakes or out of infested waters is going to be faced with the problem of keeping those intakes and their pipes clean. And so there's this annual cost of just being able to maintain access to the water. And, and you know, these companies are having to spend somewhere between 180 to, to seven or $800,000 a year just to be able to do their business. And of course, those costs are passed on to us as consumers. But while we, we're primarily interested in, in, in the impacts in the Great Lakes, the other key thing to note is that the Great Lakes have been a significant beachhead of invasion for North America. And so I'm going to run through a series of slides that essentially shows the spread of zebra and quagga mussels across the US. The, the blue and red dots are essentially showing new introductions or new detections of these species. And every time a new state is invaded, it will come up red and it'll fade to pink as it worked through the years. This is data that the USGS has maintained and we've essentially just mapped it. So as I said, in, in the late 80s, we've seen zebra and quagga mussel turn up in Lake Erie, and then we start to rapidly see it spread throughout the basin, so that within two to three years, pretty much every one of the lakes, every one of the lakes within the Great Lakes is invaded. And then we see it spread out down the Chicago Sanitary Ship Canal into the Mississippi, and then we see spread up the Mississippi with these mussels attaching to the hulls of barges and other boats. And then we see a rapid movement throughout the Mississippi, and then we just see it filling in. Basically, the whole map starts to be covered. And then, about 2007, it jumps the divide and ends up in the Colorado River system. Again, probably houseboats either coming out of the Mississippi, the Great Lakes, being transported across to Lake Mead. Those houseboats have the mussels attached to them. Uh, we see the mussels established, the zebra and quagga mussels actually in this case established uh, within Lake Mead, and then rapid spread throughout these western states, again associated with the water diversions, but also the movement of recreational boats. So again, bang, we start to see um, pretty much most of the US has become invaded by the species that ultimately, or initially, started in the Great Lakes. And, and we're now starting to see the same impacts to the hydropower system in the west that we've seen uh, out here. So the likes of Hoover Dam is now facing the same sorts of water intake problems that we've faced for 20 odd years. So I don't want to be Mr Depressing. Um, after all, you've come out and you're missing a really good game of basketball. <laughs> But what I hope to try and do in the first set of slides was just to indicate this is a real problem. It's not a bunch of greenies saying we're worried about um, you know, what's going on on the lakes. This, this is both a really real ecological as well as a real economic problem. But I don't want you to leave it there and, and go home all depressed because this is a problem with solutions and, and I think over the last 10 years there's been some exciting developments within the Great Lakes that are hopefully uh, demonstrate that we can make a difference and we can start to um, lessen some of these impacts and prevent some future impacts. And, and really we can do that by operating at each level of the invasion pathway. So there's work that we're working on to try and prevent new introductions. Uh, we're trying to, with the environmental DNA work and other things, set up decent surveillance programs so if we do get a new introduction we can find it early and, and hopefully prevent it from establishing and, and, and if, if things go well potentially eradicate it. And then we're also starting to do some work on controlling those, some of those established species to try and enable some of the the native species that come back and, and sort of restore some of the balance within the system. So uh, as you might have seen with regards to the zebra mussel spread, there are sort of four major pathways of invasion. So maritime shipping has been the most important pathway within the Great Lakes. It's accounted for about 70% uh, of the introduction since 1950. The organisms in trade uh, is the other major pathway, and here we're sort of showing a pet supply, but essentially the trade in live organisms is the legal importation and sale of any live animal or plant. And so that could be for the water garden trade, it could be the aquarium trade, it could be for live food. Um, so things like uh, beakhead and silver beakhead carp have been shifted around the country live because it's a favoured food. Um, uh, it could be for aquaculture purposes um, or for biological supplies. So really the, the, this this pathway captures all of this, all of those trades that really are shifting live animals around uh, or bringing them into the US. Traded boats and, and canals are, are really the other two major pathways. And while I'm not 
really a, a pathway by which we see introduction of the US. They are certainly pathways by which we see secondary spread. So this is how zebra and quagga mussels have, have moved around the Great Lakes and, and moved out of the Great Lakes and across the US. And so I'm going to briefly talk about each of those pathways um, and some of the work we're doing uh, to try and manage those. So this is actually work that the, I guess the US Coast Guard and the Canadian authorities are driven. What, what is now required in terms of the, the um, maritime shipping pathway is all vessel is now required to do what we would call ballast water exchange. So once an international ship gets outside the 200 nautical mile limit, it's required to exchange its ballast water three times. So when we talk about ballast water, it's the water that's taken on to essentially balance, balance the cargo. So when you've got limited cargo, you need to weigh the ship down to keep it steady. Uh, and, but of course, that cargo Cargo, that water is full of all these organisms. So what we see in terms of, uh, and then of course as you get to destination port, they discharge those. What what is now happening is that when they get outside the 200 nautical mile limit, they need they are required to flush those tanks three times. Now what that achieves is two things. First of all, you've got dilution, so you're flushing the tank three times. You're flushing a lot of the problem organisms out. But then secondly, from a fresh water point of view, you're flushing it with seawater. And most of the freshwater organisms are not capable of surviving in seawater. So just the, the salinity difference is so great that it kills any of the organisms or many of the organisms within the tank. So ballast water exchange has been a very effective method to sort of prevent introductions from this pathway. And some of the research coming out of Canada suggests it's accounted for 90 to 95 per cent of all of the species that are problematic within this ballast water pathway. And really it's only a small number of estuarine uh, species, often with resting stages that, you know, eggs that lie in the sediment that are capable of surviving that. So we've, in terms of this pathway, just by requiring ballast water exchange for all vessels, we've made a massive difference in terms of preventing new introductions. And the evidence suggests that there's been no new introductions from this pathway into the Great Lakes since about 2008. In addition, we're starting to see ballast water treatment tools developed, um, and the Coast Guard and, and um, EPA are, are likely to require treatment uh, of ballast water starting in the next two to three years. And hopefully that will be in addition to ballast water exchange. And if that's the case, that will um, lead to sort of a ten times level of protection. So it starts to knock off those last few species that are surviving. And essentially what that is is using some sort of chemical means to essentially treat the water. So we're putting some sort of toxin in the tank that will kill what's in there and then over the course of the, um, of the trip that toxin breaks down and once it's discharged it's safe to the environment. The other thing that the likes of uh, University of Michigan working on are things like ballast free vessels, so things that actually don't carry ballast water, so you overcome the problem completely. In addition to that, in terms of the trade and live organisms, um, we're now starting to do a lot of work on this pathway because it's the second most important pathway of introduction to the basin. Um, as I said, there's things like water garden trade, the aquarium trade. Um, currently the rules or the laws in, in place within the US are, are pretty lax. There are about 20 freshwater organisms that are prohibited, listed as injurious, so it's illegal to import those and, and sell them in the country. But that means that if you really want, you could probably get you could probably import a saltwater crocodile. Um, I know this is not a freshwater organism, but the, the point being is that pretty much if you want it, you can bring it in. Now that contrasts with what a number of other countries adopt, whereby they have what we would call a clean list, where there is a small number of species designated as safe, and everything else is prohibited until you can prove it's safe. Now just to sort of prove how, how ineffective the current legislation is, in 2011, beakhead carp were finally listed as injurious. I think it was a 10 or 12 year process to get that done. And the act in which uh, it was listed injurious is called the Lacey Act, and it was signed off in 1900. So it's a really old piece of legislation that really wasn't set up to manage the sorts of levers of trade that we see today. And, and just to, to point out, Big Head and Silver Carp were legally imported into the US for agricultural and water, water policy purposes. Um, and, and again, we haven't seen rules put in place until sort of 30 years after these things were established and widespread. What we see in, in countries like New Zealand and Australia, as I said, is, is they've moved towards what we would call a clean list approach. And so essentially here's a bunch of safe organisms that you can import and the onus is on the importer to prove that anything else is safe. And we're starting to see the US move in the same sorts of directions, uh, both at a state and, and federal level. So we're doing what we would call pre-import screening. The same as we screen any person trying to come into the US, we're now moving towards a system whereby we screen what is being imported to determine is it safe or not. 
Now what that requires us to do is essentially develop a set of predictive tools that say on the basis of this animal plant's biology it's likely to be problematic or not. Uh, and, and again at a state level we're starting to see the states start to develop a set of rules that, that pull out the obvious bad players so that you can't sell things like hydrilla or parrot's feather. These are, these are aquatic plants that we know are going to be problematic in the Great Lakes. And this is just a paper we recently produced, a um, collaboration between uh, University of Loyola, University of Notre Dame and the Nature Conservancy, which essentially tested and, and showed that, that a tool that the New Zealanders are using would be effective in the US to screen out the problem plants. And what we're hoping to see is both the US, USDA APHIS, which is the plant importation um, federal agency, and the states take this tool and take our data to, to, to move towards a much more consistent set of listings ac across the states within the basin and at a federal scale. The other key thing that we're trying to focus on um, is trying to harmonise the regulations within the basin. So if we think about the trailer boat pathway, currently within the Great Lakes we see a real mishmash of policy from the state of Ohio that essentially has nothing in place to the states of, of Minnesota that have, have a set of laws that essentially say you can stop, you can inspect and you can find somebody if they have a boat that's dirty, and what I mean dirty, it's got uh, invasive plants or invasive organisms on it. What it's essentially saying is that if you're a boat, you have responsibility to make sure you are not transporting uh, animals or plants between water bodies. Now what we see out in the western US in response to the threat posed by zebra and quagga mussel is that we've, every one of these states has moved towards a set of rules that, that means that they are supporting each other. It's illegal for you to move animals or plants around on, on your boat or on your trailer. And what we want to see eventually is that this whole region here, and ideally the whole of the US, is green. Because these laws are only as effective as the weakest link. And within the Great Lakes, really, you know, we've got one outstanding player here, but equally Pennsylvania and Indiana aren't doing much better. And so that undermines the efforts that we're seeing in Minnesota or Wisconsin or, or Michigan, because it's, a, it's one connected water body. Once these things are in the Great Lakes, they, many of them are capable of spreading throughout the system. Finally, I want to talk about the Chicago Canal System because Helen said I couldn't get away without talking about Asian carp. So I'm, I'm, going, to sort of, I'm going to take you through the broader canal system, but I'll also talk about the work we've been doing uh, with regards to Asian carp. So just by way of background, this is what Chicago looked like in, in the late 1800s. Um, the Chicago River flowed out into Lake Michigan, the Calumet River flowed out into Lake Michigan, and the Des Plaines River flowed down into the Illinois River. These cribs are where the city used to get its water supply from. So of course the rivers are discharging next to the cribs and in, in the late 1800s um, the sewerage systems were, were pretty rudimentary uh, or maybe non-existent uh, and we had typhoid cholera outbreaks um, uh, in Chicago probably reflecting the fact that the city's sewerage was basically being discharged into the city's water supply system. So what the city did is it basically built the Chicago Sand Ship Canal system and, re and reversed the flow of the river system so it flows now away from the Great Lakes down into the Illinois River so we could give St. Louis and the Mississippi River our sewerage as opposed to putting it in the Great Lakes. Um, so very effective for Chicago, I'm not quite sure, well I know St. Louis wasn't particularly happy about it, um, but, but what we've done is we've reversed the flow and we've done the same here with the Calumet River system and then we've enlarged the canal system so it's now capable of taking large barges because water is a very efficient way to transport these large bulk goods, you know, gravel, sand, uh, salt and, and, and petrochemicals. And so we've essentially established this very effective network in terms of getting rid of Chicago's floodwater and sewerage, but also a very effective transport network. Now, up until probably 30 or 40 years ago, this really wasn't a pathway of invasion because it was so seriously polluted. But as the Clean Water Act has taken effect and we've seen the canal system clean up, it has become, I guess, what we term a superhighway. This thing is large. We're talking um, 2,500 cubic feet per second, which I, I can't work out in my own head anyway. It's, it's a lot of water flowing per second down the water. It's, it's, a, it's 24 hours a day. It's like a large river flowing down into the Mississippi. And so that allows us to discharge our invasives into the Mississippi, but it also allows invasives to work up uh, into the Great Lakes. So two obvious players here are big head and silver carp. So native range is, is China, southern Russia. Um, this is where they, they, they belong. We imported them in the 70s for, for water, quali uh, water quality and aquaculture purposes. By the mid-70s they were already in the wild within the Mississippi. We've seen spread throughout the Mississippi system and the Illinois River. Now when we got involved 
the invasion from is thought, is thought to have stalled out in what we call the Dresden Island Pool. So here, Lake Michigan here, city of Chicago, um, Des Plaines into the Illinois River. Uh, Beacon and Silver Cup rapidly move up through the system, so they're, they're up by sort of Marcel um, starved rock by the 2000s, and then by about 2008, um, 2007, 2008, um, that reached a sort of 18 miles south of, of, of the Chicago um, of, of the Chicago waterfront. Um, but the biologists thought that the invasion had stalled out at that point. So all of their monitoring said, we can't catch any fish further up in the system. And so for whatever reason, the invasion stopped here. Now, when we got involved, it just like, this makes no sense. Why, why would the fish decide that, oops, we don't want to go to Chicago? <laughs> What we did note, though, is that we go from a natural river system, or semi-natural river system, so a system that has lots of shallow embayments that are conducive to fishing, to a canal system that's basically just a big box. It's, it's 100 to, to 2 to 300 yards across. It's 20, 10 or 15 yards deep. And in terms of the techniques that we have to catch these things, that is probably the hardest place to try and catch them. So we wondered whether the pattern that we were seeing was real, or whether it really just reflected a detection limitation. So what we know is the electric fishing boats, uh, the nets are not effective in this water. This sort of cartoon is trying to sort of depict what we're trying to do. Here we have a sort of a caricature of, of the canal system, and this is what this is trying to show you is the effective fishing field on of an electric fishing boat. So this is what an electric fishing boat looks like. It's putting a current into the water. That current is really only fishing over two to three to four, sorry, two to three yard radius around where you're putting that water in, and maybe one to two yards deep. So it's, it's really fishing a really small area, and you're trying to catch a fish that's maybe three, three feet long, that's more than capable of, a, of avoiding the boat, and is also highly sensitive to sound, and particularly the sounds that an outboard motor will put out. So you're fishing this big box, pushing an electric field in front of you, creating lots of noise, and expecting to catch something. And the simple reality is, we just can't catch these sorts of fish in a canal system. And so the pattern that we're seeing back here probably just reflects the fact that we've gone from having lots of shallow embayments that we can effectively fish to a canal where we can't effectively fish. And in addition, if you're trying to set a net in this, incredibly hard. You, you don't have anywhere to, to put it. But we also know that these fish are incredibly good at avoiding nets. Dwayne Chapman, who is probably the authority on this fish, talks about netting off a two to 300 metre reach of the Missouri River. He had four Asian carp in that reach that he had transmitters on. He set nets in that reach and he chased them around for three to four days with two boats. Much smaller system than this, couldn't catch them. Now, in terms of invasion, we're not trying to catch hundreds of thousands of fish, we're trying to catch small numbers of fish. And I think one of the problems we've seen with Asian carp is that many of you may have seen the videos that you see these silver carp jumping out of the water. And I think that lulled us into this false sense of security that said, well, we can see these things, they're easy. But if you think about where that occurs, it's where there are hundreds of thousands of fish. By the time that we start seeing silver carp jumping out of the water, it's all over. It's too late. We need to catch the first 10 or 20, not 100,000. So we very much felt that this pattern reflected a failure to detect as opposed to what was really going on. And so that led us to explore a set of uh, genetic detection tools that would allow us to try and find these fish remotely as opposed to having them at hand. Now, there's been a lot of talk about how this is a new method. The simple reality is, is that biologists have been using this method for over 20 years, just not in fresh water. So if you want to take a genetic sample of a large bear, do you wander up to it and pluck out a bit of hair? As a Kiwi, not the sort of thing I would think of doing. What you can do, though, is that you can collect the hair off, off a wire fence, or you can collect the dropping, its faeces, and extract the DNA out of that. And so essentially, what we're talking about is ind indirect methods of taking the genetic sample. The same applies to something like a whale. Rather than flying, firing a dart into the whale and taking a tissue plug that will upset the animal, you can collect genetic material out of the water, either from their faeces or from cells slothing off. And you can do the genetic work, that, that the population sort of studies, that you might want to do. So understanding who's related to who, or what species it is. This is a, a red fox, and the, the Tasmanians have been facing an invasion of, of red fox. Very small numbers of cryptic nocturnal animals that they can't see. Uh, lots of debate about whether it's real or not. 
They have a set of beagles that go around finding droppings. They then extract the DNA out of those droppings to determine was it a fox or not. And then if they find evidence of fox, they can put a team in to try and control them. So the method has been used. It just hasn't really been applied in fresh water. So what we decided is we thought we could see if we could make something work for Asian carp. One of the advantages we have is that these things are large. They feed up to 10% of their body mass a day. So that means that they are producing lots of faeces, lots of urine. That means they are shedding, they're putting lots of cells out into the water. So lots of your gut cells uh, are slothing off, and, and, and so when they're releasing faeces or urine into the water, they're also releasing those cells into the water. And what we're trying to do is detect a plume of DNA. So rather than trying to find this two to three feet fish that's mobile, we're trying to detect the plume of DNA that it's producing in the water. Now the best analogy I can come up with is essentially, if you think of a car driving along a gravel road, and it's putting up a dust cloud. Now, if you were on the side of the gravel road, you walked up to the gravel road and there was this big dust cloud in the air, you'd know a car has passed. So what we're trying to do is sample this dust cloud. And then what we can tell is rather than, you know, from the dust cloud, so from the DNA plume, we can look at the genetics and say, this is what species was in that plume. So all we're doing is we collect lots of two litre water samples. So we might take one or two, you know, one to 150 samples uh, from a you know, five to 10 mile stretch of water. We filter that water through really fine glass fibre filters. We then extract the DNA off that and then we amplify it, uh, increase it, the numbers of it, and then screen it for the specific DNA we're looking for. And that allows us to basically detect whether we see big head or silver carp. So this is a summary of our work within the Chicago Canal system. So again, the water is flowing from Lake Michigan down to um, the lower river. This is the electric barrier that was put in place by the Army Corps of Engineers to, pre to prevent Asian carp moving up into the Great Lakes. We started our work down here, showed we could get positives in the Des Plains where they knew fish were. We rapidly showed we could detect DNA up here in Brandon Road Pool, and then again demonstrated that below the barrier there was fish likely to be present. Um, we then shifted our focus to above the barrier, and, and essentially all of these red spots are places where we have detected DNA on multiple occasions, usually for silver carp, but on some occasions big head carp too. And this is the entrance of the Calumet River. This is Lake Michigan. These uh, red triangles are four water samples where we detected the DNA of silver carp. Given everything we know of the system, given the general pattern, that led us to conclude that there was evidence of live fish within the system. We then switched our focus to the Great Lakes, and uh, from a series of samples that we collected in 2011, we got a set of positives from Sandusky Bay here in, in Lake Erie, and also a set of, so that's for big head carp, and a set of positive silver carp here in the, in the upper Maumee area in, in western Lake Erie. These uh, triangles here, I'm oh, sorry, these stars, uh, yellow stars here, are locations in which big head carp have formerly been captured. So in 1996, and again twice in 2000, three big head carp have been caught within Lake Erie. So all we feel we have done is prove that these carp are still present in the system. And as Dwayne Chapman said in a, in a state hearing in Illinois three years ago, if you think we caught the only three big head carp in Lake Erie, you're dreaming. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a big lake system, and so the simple reality is all we've done with our DNA is really prove what should have been obvious. However, there's clearly a, another side to the story. Um, and, and really, we've seen litigation within the basin where we've had the state of Illinois um, uh, really, and, and the federal agencies arguing with the other states who have been arguing we need to close the canal system down in order to prevent the Asian, these Asian carp uh, getting into the basin. It, because that litigation is really based on the environmental DNA evidence, we've ended up with two camps. There are those that accept the eDNA evidence, and really most of the states within the basin are using the tool and believe in the tool. And then we've got another small group of, of federal agencies who either publicly say they don't believe in the evidence or actually don't believe in the evidence. Uh, so I, I think what I'm going to try and do over the next two to three slides is sort of tell you what they're saying and then say why we disagree with it and, and do that as politely as possible. <laughs> Um, so the reason we keep arguing that the, the most plausible explanation for the DNA patterns that we see is the presence of a live fish is that the only place that we are detecting DNA of Beckett and Silver Carp is where these fish have been caught. So again, 
Below the barrier, we, we've seen silver carp observed in Brown Road Pool. A beakhead carp was taken out of Lockport, cool, Lockport Pool uh, following the, the treatment operation uh, in 2009. And then, of course, we in 2010, in June, we had a beakhead carp taken out of Lake Calumet, which is above the O'Brien Lock. There's nothing between Lake Calumet and, and Lake Michigan. Again, all in places where we have detected the DNA of this fish. Again, if we go back to these detections again within Lake Erie, we've had big head carp detected within Lake Erie. We're detecting the DNA. Now, silver carp would be the only exception there. What we do know is that silver carp and big head carp hybridise. And so the fact that we detected silver carp DNA doesn't actually mean to say it was um, actually a silver carp. It could well have been a hybrid. Either way, the simple reality is, is when we detect DNA, fish are being collected. But if you look at the general patterns of our detection, we've looked throughout all of these river systems, we've looked throughout Lake St. Clair, we don't detect DNA in all of these other systems. Now what the federal agencies are arguing is that the DNA is coming from some alternative source. So it could be a barge, on the hull of a barge, the DNA stuck there and it's, it's being dragged upstream. It could be a dead fish in the barge that someone kicks over the side and we're detecting the dead fish DNA. It could be some bird that's fed on juvenile carp, it's flown up, it's done its business in the canal system, we're detecting that. Uh, or it could be live fish from a food market. The problem with all of these pathways is that they operate pretty much throughout the basin. So why are we not detecting DNA in the Port of Indiana, where, have, where we have a large cormorant roost, where the barges from the canal go? Why don't we detect, you know, again, in the city of Grand Rapids, why are we not detecting DNA where there might be fish markets or other things? The other thing is for these birds, most of these birds are only foraging over a sort of 12 to 15 to 20 kilometre range. Um, what's that in miles? 8 to 10 miles. Um, whereas the nearest populations of juvenile carp are probably a minimum of 2 to 300 miles away, well outside the natural foraging distances. Now, individual birds are more than capable of, 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 of travelling those sorts of distances, but we, in terms of the probability of detection, we're talking about a bird that might put a small amount, one-off amount of DNA in a system versus a fish that's moving and constantly putting out a plume of DNA. So if you think about the probabilities of detection, which is more likely? Science is about the, the most simple answer is usually the most likely answer. The presence of a live fish, we know they are in the system, is more likely to be true than the fact that we needed to be on in the right place at the right time on the right day when that bird did its business and we needed some. It's just, it requires all sorts of things to happen. So that's why, on the basis of all the evidence that we've looked at, we still believe the most plausible explanation for the patterns that we see are the presence of live fish. Um, and, and and really, it's the evidence on which we need to base a response as opposed to spending lots of time looking at other, other potential but less plausible pathways. But while we've tended to focus very much on the Asian carp, really this canal is a superhighway for a range of other species. And so there's about 29 species in the Great Lakes that currently aren't in the Mississippi that this canal could enable to spread in the Mississippi Basin. And there's 10 species, including bighead and silver carp, that are in the Mississippi that aren't in the Great Lakes. And so in terms of um, the sort of need for ecological separation, it's not just Asian carp, it's very much about the broader picture, the long term. Um, and, and really, if we want to keep many of our problematic species out of the Mississippi, it's just as, if not more important, that we close this pathway down. And, and the simple reality is, is there are some really s simple but probably expensive solutions. And that we can restore the natural separation within the system and do it in a way that allows the canal to still function as it has, getting rid of Chicago sewage and stormwater, still allowing it to transport the bulk goods, but preventing the two-way spread. And the, and the Great Cities and, and, and Great, Lake, Great Cities Initiative and Great Lakes Commission recently released a report called Restoring the Natural Divide that essentially outlined three options as, as a sort of a proof of concept where you could essentially restore that natural divide, separate the systems. The price tag was three to nine billion dollars, which sounds a lot like a lot of money, but when you look at the price tag, only one to two hundred million dollars of that price tag is actually about building the barrier. Most of the cost is about upgrading Chicago's infrastructure, which has to happen anyway. So this should be a no-brainer. And, and, and the key now is how do we get the Army Corps of Engineers on board, and how do we come up with a set of solutions that, that will keep the barge operators happy, 
and, and enable them to continue to do their business. And it's in everybody's interest to do that. And certainly the objectives that, that Team Eater and Dave Ulrich set out was that they wanted to have a win-win for everybody. The simple reality is, is that Chicago's infrastructure is ageing, it needs to be upgraded, and it should be very simple for us to build uh, a set of barriers into, into that plan. In terms of the Asian CARP response, there is a large federal response going on. The federal and government has spent well over $120 million on that response. Now that's, that money is primarily, if not all of it, is going to either the federal agencies, so the Fish and Wildlife Service, EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, to, to build some more barriers, to improve the current barriers, or it's going to the likes of Illinois DNR to fund their crews to get out in the water to do stuff. Now, we can probably debate the effectiveness of some of the things they're doing, but certainly there are some exciting developments coming out of, of this response program that will both enable effective um, management of Asian carp, but also will allow us to start to focus on some of these established species within the basin. We can also learn a lot from the sea lamprey control program within the Great Lakes. This is sort of the model that the world uses to develop integrated pest management programs for aquatic pests around the globe. So the sea lamprey life cycle, you have your adult parasitic, parasitic phase uh, within the lake. They then migrate upstream to spawn. Um, the larvae stay within the system for three to 17 years and then they migrate downstream. Now, the, the, the management program for, for sea lamprey uh, essentially relies on a set of barriers to try and deny access to the spawning grounds for the adults coming back. They have a set of traps often at these barriers to take those adult fish out. Um, because the larval phase in the, is in the river system for so long, we also see what we call lamprocyte treatment. So this is putting in a, a toxin that will kill the young larvae. Um, and then the other thing they're doing is they're also introducing sterile males so that they interfere with spawning at this point. Now this program has been very effective. This graph focuses on the red line here. This is The blue is lake trout numbers. Um, and this is time across the bo bottom here. Sea lamprey control program started in the early 1960s. And what you see is a dramatic decrease. And while we haven't eradicated sea lamprey, we have successfully controlled sea lamprey across the Great Lakes, which is an amazing feat. Um, and, and that, and probably some changes in what we do from a fishing point of view, has enabled lake trout to start to recover. Um, this is just the, uh, the mouthpiece of a sea lamprey, if, if you really wanted to look up close. <laughs> Now, one of the other um, novel methods that's coming out of, of the uh, Asian Cup Response Plan is something called um, uh, seismic te technology. So this is a, a, a water gun. These were originally developed by geology industry to enable deep sea survey work to, to locate oil reservoirs or you know, oil, oil deposits. Uh, essentially what it's putting out is, is, a, is a sound pulse into the water. I don't know whether any, any of you in your youth um, did a bit of fishing with explosives. Um, it's the same, it's probably not the sort of thing you do, um, but it's the same sort of principle. You're putting the sound energy into the water and, and it basically, so the geologists were using it to map the rock layers, but it has the same impact upon um, uh, same impact that explosives have on, on life in the water. So the water guns were discontinued as, 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 as a survey tool by the geologists, but we think it's got potential as a control tool or at least as a way to sort of herd fish. So currently the commercial fishermen herd Asian carp in the river by banging on the side of their boats. And we think there's probably a much more effective way to put sound in the water and the right type of sound to drive these fish. And so um, one of our collaborators has been working within the canal system trying to to basically develop this tool to, to drive Asian carp into nets so it would allow us to sort of systematically fish some of this canal system and drive the fish into big box traps or something along these lines. This is, this is uh, again one of these water guns, this is what happens when you fire it. Um, so you know, this, this boat's stationary, there's no reason for these fish to be jumping. Um, but again, you, you put that sound pulse in the water and, and clearly these fish are reacting. Um, and then this is, I won't go into the mechanics, but essentially it's a pneumatic you're essentially forcing water out and it's causing a popping sound that's driving that energy into the water. One of the other things that, uh, so one of the other things that the USGS lab in La Crosse is working on is coming up with some novel ways in which we can get toxins into fish. So the, the current sort of toxin that we use is something called rotenone. And I don't know whether you remember the, the old pictures of the Amazonian Indians collecting tree roots and, and banging those up and squeezing the juice out and then pouring that juice in the water and then watching fish surface downstream. That's rotenone. It's a, it's a natural toxin that occurs in the roots of, of plants from the legumous family. Um, 
and, and it's been used by indigenous people actually across the globe as a fishing tool. And, and so it has been the tool that, that fisheries managers have used to, to treat waters. The trouble is it's a generalised fish toxin, it takes everything out. It's, not, it's actually not particularly dangerous to people. It's, you can eat fish killed by this method um, because you, you, it's very difficult for you to get rotenone into your blood system and you rapidly metabolise it anyway. Equally within, within the natural environment it oxidises quickly so the sunlight uh, will mean it, it will break down very rapidly at, at warm temperatures. Its half-life is only um, you know, two or three days. Um, so, but what the USGS is doing is it's taking tools from the pharmacology industry and essentially it's trying to put toxins in these sort of micro particles and, and do it in a way that the toxin is inert. It's not toxic in the particle. But then working on the, the natural digestive tract and the natural enzymes within the system, trying to come up with what, some way that's unique to Asian carp or zebra and quagga mussel so that when they feed on this micro particle, there's something about their digestive tract that then releases the toxin and, and you get mortality. So we're trying to come up with a selective way to treat. The other thing is if we make this pellet the right size, and we're talking you know, microns, um, we can take advantage of the fact that these things selectively take different size organisms out of the water column. So we take advantage of the natural filtering of these things and the fact that they focus on a narrow range of particles. And so USGS is, is, is developing these things and, it, and it, it has the potential to allow us to go in and treat areas very effectively, very selectively, and just take out the big head and silver carp and nothing else. Now we're, we're using these tools ourselves to, to do some other things. So we have a project with uh, Smith Root, who is the company that's now developing um, the seismic technology, uh, also working with Central Michigan University and Michigan DNR, where we're trying to control uh, round goby and rusty crayfish to introduce predators on small spawning reefs. These spawning reefs are not, not much bigger, actually sometimes smaller than this room. So these are tiny gravel, so this is what a reef in, in, in a Great Lake sense look like. So these sort of gravel bars are incredibly important for successful spawning of lake trout, lake herring and lake whitefish. So we have a series of reefs up in uh, Grand Traverse Bay and Little Traverse Bay that these three species are spawning on. The problem we, we have is that when we see spawning in the late fall, the round goby and crayfish are moving onto these reefs and essentially devouring the eggs before they get a chance to, 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 um, to develop and to hatch. So what we're trying to do is go in and take uh, these, these, benthic, these bottom predators out uh, and suppress their numbers immediately prior to spawning and into the winter period when these, these predators move off in order to encourage increased survivorship of these eggs with the hope that we can see increased recruitment and we start to develop a self-sustaining population. So we get to the point that there's so much spawning occurring on these reefs it actually doesn't matter what the predators are doing, they just can't. We swamp them out of the system if that makes sense. The other key thing is, is that many of the problem species that we have in the basin are problem species elsewhere in the world. And so there are things like the Australian Animal Invasive um, uh, Cooperative Research Centre that are working on tools to manage things like common carp. Um, and equally, New York State Museum, there's, there's a bunch of players both within the US and globally that are trying to come up with new tools. And that's again, we might be using sort of specific diseases. This is an example of koi herpes virus, which selectively kills cyprinids. It's probably not, so this is the carp family, probably not something we would use in the US, but in the likes of Australia and New Zealand that don't have any native carp species, an excellent tool for us to take out some of these introduced species. Again, looking at some select toxins, attractants, barriers. So there's a, what we ultimately need to do is come up with a, a suite of tools that allow us to target these key species at key places either within the basin. One of the other thing, exciting things that's starting to happen is that there's a small amount of evidence to suggest that the Great Lakes might be fighting back. So Lake Whitefish and Lake Herring, there's evidence to suggest that they're starting to prey upon um, zebra and quagga mussels and, and, and on the, the spiny water flea. It's been postulated that the reason that um, zebra and quagga mussels are not as abundant in Lake Huron as opposed to Lake Michigan is that we have a much more abundant population of whitefish and they're feeding successfully on uh, zebra and quagga mussels within Lake Huron. So there's some suggestion that maybe the system is starting to push back and the worm is starting to turn. Now I'm sort of trying to turn back to my New Zealand analogy at the end. One of the things that New Zealand has successfully developed is a set of tools to take rats off offshore islands. Now they started this in the late 80s where they were working on islands of five or ten acres in size. They are now 
uh, working on islands of over 20 thousand acres in size. They're now taking those methods and applying them on the mainland and protecting large forest blocks. If we think about freshwater systems, they are really, particularly in the lakes and, and rivers, they are really islands and a sea of land. And so we can start to adopt the same sorts of practices where we're focusing on these small isolated water bodies and we start to develop and refine those tools. And as those tools, as we better understand those tools, we better understand their impacts and their effectiveness, we can start to scale those up. And really that's what we're going to ultimately try and do within the basin. And, and I think really we are well paused to really be the New Zealand equivalent uh, in terms of aquatic pest management. Uh, we've got some great partnerships, some great long-term collaborations. We've seen some real investment over the last five to ten years. And if we can sustain that as well as the policy development within the basin, I think we really can lead the world and, and the US in terms of developing successful aquatic pest management tools. And again, start to do some things in the basin that will allow many of the native fish and, and other native parts of the community to come back and restore some of that natural balance. And I'll leave you with that um, in, in terms of uh, uh, talking about aquatic invasive species. That, that's, that's me done in terms of that. I just wanted to point out that um, before we come to questions, um, Helen Taylor down here, I won't point that in your eyes, Helen, uh, is talking on April the 18th about the, the changing scale of conservation. Um, and here are some contact details if, if, uh, if you want to uh, find some more out about the Nature Conservancy or, or get hold of us in terms of um, some of the things we've talked about tonight or, or at other talks. And happy now to, to take questions. Thank you very much. It's not really just simply because of the, the scale of the Great Lakes. So, um, uh, and probably the reality is if we think of the system, um, you, you're only flushing a small part of your tank at any one point, but even, even then, even if you flushed all of the salt water in your tank, just dilution is so great that it really wouldn't cause a problem. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really not an issue. And, and again, with the, with the treatment options are starting to develop, again, dilution in this case is, is the solution if, if some of that's left. Um, just the, you know, it's twenty percent of the world's fresh water, and, and we're talking about a f maybe a few hundred thousand gallons. Does that make sense? But it's, it's a good question. Well, related to that, you said it's been X amount of years that somebody has been, um, you know, saying that we had to do the rinsing of the water three times. So is that a global thing? Is that a U.S. thing? And how long has that been going on that we have to? So, so I think not. Yep, no, great question. So in 1996, um, I think the U.S. and Canada required ships with what we would call pumpable ballast water on board to um, initiate ballast water exchange. And then in 2007, uh, the US and Canada, well, US following, I think Canada did it early, required all vessels to do it. So there are, there are these ships called no-bobs, so that's no pumpable ballast water on board. What that means is that these tanks uh, have probably what we would call a residual amount of water, but that water is still capable of holding life. And, and really that was, once we got all vessels doing it, that's when we probably started to be effective. Um, because the big issue is actually probably that, that bottom part of the tank where there's sediment, where all the organisms are probably sitting. Um, and so I think it was 2007 when it started. In terms of from a global point of view, it varies from country to country. So Australia and New Zealand I think require ballast water exchange. Um, and there's something called the International Maritime Organisation, uh, which uh, essentially all, all, many of the world's um, countries are signatures to and, and they have come up with a standard which is called the IMO standard which requires treatment of a ballast water tank down to 10 organisms per cubic metre, so sort of uh, that amount of water. Which actually the US was arguing for something either 10 or 100 times that. Um, I think what is likely to happen now is, is that uh, both the Coast Guard and EPA are, are going to settle on the IMO standard as their first set of rules, and one would hope that in the next five years or so, we'll see that ramping up. Thanks. From the time a water sample was taken to the time you know whose DNA was in it, what's the timeline? Um, depends on how good you are. Um, <laughs> but, but so typically for us, we will collect 120 samples, and it will take, it'll, we try and have those samples filtered within 12, no more than 24 hours. 
Um, and um, so we, yeah, typically we'll be up to one or two o'clock in the morning filtering them, depending on the state of the water. And then if, if those samples were a priority, we could process them in, in three to five days, um, possibly sooner. Now, it's the, what we saw within the canal system um, was that we were collecting water samples quicker than that we could process them. And, and we, we're not a, com you know, the Notre Dame lab is not a commercial lab. So it's got lots of research projects on the go and, and it's a matter of getting in the queue to get them processed. So one of the problems we had with the Lake Erie samples was we collected those in 2011. We hadn't got to them by December. Our lab tech resigned and it took us three months to fill that position. So we didn't get around to running those samples until June, you know, eight months later. Now, we were doing a research project. We weren't trying to delimit the extent of Asian carp. What we're now seeing is the Fish and Wildlife Service will lead those efforts and we would expect them to be turning around um, something like 120 samples a week. Um, and, and so over the sort of June, July period, they'll be taking something like 200 samples and we would expect those to be processed probably by, the, by December. If, if, if things go well, no equipment breakdowns, the labs are working, etc. Can you use the microphone? Oh, sorry. Yep. Is Lake Superior, uh, does that have invasive species? Because you don't talk about it as much as... Um, no, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. The question was, does Lake Superior have invasive species? And and, um, and like, because I haven't talked about it, y yes, it does. Um, uh, probably of all the lakes, though, it's probably least affected by both uh, zebra and quagga mussels and round goby. Uh, I'm not quite entirely sure why that is. It may be temperature. It may be just part of the invasion cycle. Um, because it's the cooler of the two lake of of all of the lakes, um, some of the species don't do quite as well within Superior as it does elsewhere. But and, and, and in many ways, my understanding is that the native communities are in the most healthy state within Superior. So there's probably some resilience within the system as well. So yes, it has the problems, but you know, really, it's the it's the bottom four lakes, um, and probably Lake Erie in particular, that's been most impacted. Followed then probably by Lake Michigan. Well, one more. Yep. Um, yeah, and well, and, and, well, I don't mean that it could be more educated. There's been a lot of emphasis placed on education, um, and um, plenty of debate about whether that education has been effective or not. Um, but there's a lot of programs. There's the Clean Boat, Clean Water program. Um, most states have an education program, which is really emphasising those processes of, of really inspecting your boat and, and washing your boat down. Uh, there was some research out of, actually out of Notre Dame that showed a, 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 a power wash is a very effective way to clean the hull of your boat, to clean up uh, out, the outboard motor. And we're starting to see, uh, in particular in the likes of uh, northern Michigan, Wisconsin, the Forest Service actually putting in place these boat washing stations. And I think what we'll start to see over the, over the next five or ten years is that on some of, the, some of these key source locations, so some of these invaded inland lakes or some of these key Great Lakes Landing, we'll see boat wash stations being put in place just to do what you're saying, to, to basically provide boat owners with a, with a way so they can be responsible. But, but certainly in, in the first instance, most of the states now require you to drain uh, all of your, um, you know, your, your bait holding tanks, drain anything else that's holding water. And the other thing you should be doing is really just walking around the outside of your boat. Most of the invasive species can be removed through inspection, but if you've got the ability to wash and wipe down the boat, that would be the other thing to consider. And, and yeah, some, the clean boat, clean water campaign would be, is, there's lots of good material on that sort of, um, what are good protocols. Sir? Yep. Were those supplied by like commercial fishermen or sport fishermen? How did you, what were they actually? Um, yeah, actually, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, I suspect it's probably a combination of both. Um, actually, I think it's both commercial and recreational fishers that pick them up. Um, the thing with big head carp is they do often feed at the surface, um, and they'll do something called pump feeding where they're coming up and, and basically 
sort of forcing water through their thing, uh, through their gills. Um, and so they, in the right places, they can be highly visible. Um, but actually, I, I don't actually know. My assumption is it's both a combination of commercial and recreational fishes that pick them up. Now, oh, sorry, go. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, well, so uh, it's unclear what the minimum number of fish would be required to establish a self-sustaining population. Uh, I think in the, the the risk assessment document that was produced, it was a binational risk assessment document produced by Canada and the US, I think they, they talk about 20 fish is what would be required. Uh, my understanding is there's no real science associated with that. Um, the simple reality is the more fish you have in the system, the more likely they are of establishing. Um, for some species, like say the New Zealand mud snail, one might be enough because they're pathogenic. That single animal is capable of producing viable um, offspring. Uh, the same with some of these, uh, these aquatic plants. A, a single piece of plant will be capable of forming a new colony. From Asian carp, it's, it's unclear what that number is. Uh, I've heard the same sorts of numbers that you've been talking about. I, I think the reality is if you get the right number of fish in the right place at the right time, you can get recruitment. Um, it's just not clear what that number is likely to be. But the more we have in the system, the more likely of success. And certainly that's why shoring up the electric barriers, putting in place additional barriers in the Chicago Canal system is so important because we know we have hundreds of thousands of fish in the Low Illinois River and, and the more of those that would get through to the Great Lakes, the, the surer we are of having an established population. The, yep. How, how extensive is that? Is that something that's really happening right now or is that just in the research phase? Oh, it's very much in the research phase. So, so the, the process from here will be, they've got to do essentially a set of pond trials where they've got caged fish that they'll try and see whether it works. Um, and then they may, um, it's probably likely that they'll just do any of their initial trials within enclosed facilities. And then there's a long process they've got to go through with the EPA uh, and, and the Food and Drug um, Food and Drug Authority, FDA, um, to in order to get approval to apply this in, in the environment. So we, we're probably a minimum of five years before something like this will be available. Is that, is that, a, um, is that being really championed? Because the concern I would have there is like, what happens to the carcasses of the animal and that it's eaten and that it, and that it biodegrades and then I mean, on and on and on? Well, no, so, so, so it's a great question. I think. My understanding is that what the USGS is trying to do is it's, if, it ha if, it, if it comes up with a toxin, they'll be coming up with something that um, biodegrades rapidly. So if you, if you were to kill that fish, the, the, the toxin itself will be gone. So, so you're not going to see that toxin spread through the food chain. Um, so and something like rotenone is, is, is an example of that. You'll see birds feeding on dead fish. Those birds don't die because the, the rotenone is broken down. So my understanding is that if they come up with a toxin, they'll be coming up with something that will break down easily that is not a threat to the environment, so it's not like the sort of the dioxins that, that have half-lives of hundreds or thousands of years. <clears throat> In addition to that, what they have to show is that they need to show that this delivery mechanism is species specific. So we, we're talking about these micro sort of like pieces of salt in size uh, that, that only a filter feeder would be capable of picking up. Uh, and, and again, what they're going to play around with is, is timing and, and some chemical mechanism that means it's only likely to be Asian carp that would take it out of the water. So what we know from the biology is that uh, silver carp, bickhead carp are feeding earlier in the year than the native filter feeders. So if you were to do this uh, much earlier in the year, again, you can target the invasive and, and avoid the native who's still hunkered down, um, you know, sleeping out the winter. Now. In terms of what, what do we do about the large numbers of carcasses, I don't know that there's been a lot of thought about applying this yet in something like the Mississippi. The focus here is 
What do we do when we get to Texans and say Sandusky Bay or the Sandusky River? Rather, currently, the only options to us is, is do nothing or dewater the river or treat it with rotenone, which will kill all of the fish in the system. What this will allow us to do is treat it in a way that would allow us to take out a much smaller, smaller select group. Um, but the simple reality is the FDA, EPA are set up to, to ensure that whatever has come up with is environmentally sensible. And so the, the researchers at USGS are very much coming at it in full knowledge that they need to come up with something that's safe um, because there's no way they'll get approval to use it if it's not. One more question? Tim? Um, oh, yes, um, but 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 I think what typically what you'll see with any invasion is is um, you'll see a long lag phase where you see establishment. So that's when you've got small numbers, and then you often see an exponential increase, and they'll actually shoot past their carrying capacity and then drop back. And then the simple reality is you'll see natural sort of cycles if that makes sense. Uh, and often, <coughs> often the sort of carrying the ultimate carrying capacity might be well below what they initially reach in terms of their abundance. And partly that reflects the fact that you know, they strip a lot of the food out of the system and then to maintain that lower level of, um, or, or, or the, the maintenance level below that is, is much lower. So you, 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 they'll shoot past the carrying capacity and then drop back down to some sort of more sustainable level. Now, something like our wife, which is a which is a sort of a boomer bus species, you see these big our wife booms and then it'll drop down to nothing. And, and, and one of the things we've seen in the in Lake Erie is, is that the alewife population has crashed because we overstocked with, with, the, with the introduced salmonids and they've forced that population down and what that is now allowing is some of the native uh, midwater species to come back uh, as a competitor. Does it? So more than happy to take questions afterwards. Um, yeah, please, thank you very much. And Thank you, Lindsay. Very interesting. And thank you all for coming tonight. We hope you will join us on April 18th for our final lecture in the series, featuring Helen Taylor, who's with us here tonight. Thank you.